Welcome back to my series, The Bible Doesn't Make Any Sense. Today's episode, Genesis chapter 1 through chapter 3. This is the story of Adam and Eve. All right, let's see if we can help make it make sense. So everyone knows that God created humans on the sixth day of creation. But what I didn't know is that that did not include Adam and Eve. Matter of fact, Adam and Eve are not mentioned at all in Genesis chapter 1 when God created the earth and everything on it. They don't pop up until chapter 2. So how were they the first two humans and populated the rest of the earth? They weren't and they didn't. I was like, okay, so Adam and Eve weren't the first ones on earth. Who were these other people? What's their story? Did, were they sinners from birth? Were they running around naked on earth? Then I got to chapter 2 and everything changed. Chapter 2 is written as if chapter 1 does not exist. Or at the very least, chapter 2 is written as if it comes before chapter 1. Both of these observations are correct. Genesis chapter 2 was written before Genesis chapter 1. And Genesis chapter 2 has absolutely nothing to do with Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1 is something that came along in later generations because authors did not like the theology of Genesis chapter 2 and so felt it needed to be updated and corrected and superseded. And probably the biggest difference between the two is that in Genesis chapter 2, God creates and then observes that there's something that's not good about their creation. But then through trial and error, has to try to improve the creation, but they struggle to find a suitable companion. In Genesis chapter 1, the main difference there is that God creates and immediately God sees that it was good. So this is a way to create a more theologically correct, in the eyes of the authors of Genesis chapter 1, creation account. And so Genesis 2 was written before Genesis 1 and was written completely independently of Genesis 1. And then the two were probably put on the same scroll at some point in order to ensure that both would be preserved. And we now read them as if they're part of the same story and they're not. When God told Adam about the tree of knowledge, he told him that if he ate the fruit, he would surely die, which was a flat out lie because that's not what happened. So God is a liar. Interesting. So I too have concluded that God is lying in Genesis 2:17 because their statement that on the day you eat of it, you will certainly die simply does not happen. And that is the consensus view of scholars who have looked at this passage. However, not everyone concludes this means this is a lie. Folks like John Day and James Barr have arrived at other conclusions. This is James Barr's article from 2006, Is God a Liar? Genesis 2 through 3 and Related Matters. And here Barr is going to uh, point out that there's not really a convincing way around the fact that what God states in Genesis 2.17 simply does not happen, uh, but is not willing to go so far as to call it a lie. And here's a bit from the middle paragraph of the conclusion. If the immediate death forecast for Adam and Eve had taken place, of course, there would be nothing to explain since there would be no further story. There would be no human race, no Abraham or Moses, no people Israel, no Jesus Christ. In the event, God quickly detects the disobedience and issues his series of verdicts upon the snake, the woman, and the man in that order. God, as I see it, does not go back to his warning of immediate death. That is now passed, and he says nothing about it. He swiftly detects that they have disobeyed his one commandment, but he wants the man and woman to live. A new situation has now been created, and the warning issued beforehand is now simply left aside by him. So this is somewhat related to my position that this is kind of like uh, a parent who uh, uses a hyperbolic threat against their children but then doesn't follow through with it instead and punishes them in a different way. And then in his book, From Creation to Babel, John Day also addresses the fact that what is stated in Genesis 2.17 simply does not happen, but goes on to endorse a reading very similar to James Barr's that God's grace and mercy resulted in that threatened punishment not being carried out. But do you know who didn't lie? The serpent. Genesis 3, chapter 4, the serpent says, You will not certainly die, for God knows that when you eat it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Which is exactly what happened, and God himself confirms it. Genesis 3, chapter 22, And the Lord God said, The man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. Now tell me, who sounds like the villain in this story? The texture seems like God is the antagonist here rather than the protagonist. Uh, and I have argued that the three main narrative arcs of the primeval history of Genesis 1 through 11, uh, Adam and Eve, the flood, 
the Tower of Babel, each represent attempts on the part of humanity to encroach upon the boundaries of deity, to achieve some kind of uh, divine status and immortality uh, that God has to confront and has to uh, challenge and overcome. And so I think these stories are closely related to other stories from ancient Southwest Asia, like Gilgamesh, like the myth of Adapa, where the deities are trying to protect their purview over things like immortality and divine status and keep the humans out. And we even have in the myth of Adapa, a deity telling Adapa not to eat the food of death, uh, but it's actually the food of life that's going to make Adapa uh, immortal, but he refuses the food and then gets uh, sent back down to earth to live out a life of mortality. So uh, concepts that are closely related to what's going on in the story of the Garden of Eden. So I think these stories uh, fit very comfortably within the literary context of these ancient Southwest Asian contemplations on mortality and immortality and humanity and deity. But there's also a sense in which the serpent has tricked uh, or deceived Eve, as she states in Genesis 3.13, because the serpent does not let Eve know that they're going to be kicked out of the garden. Uh, the serpent probably knows there's going to be some kind of punishment coming for disobeying God. Uh, the serpent tells the truth regarding what will happen uh, if they eat the fruit, but this still results in them being punished, being expelled from the Garden of Eden, being cursed. And so in that sense, the serpent still tricks Eve, as Eve recognizes again in verse 13. The Bible also proves that there were other people on earth before Adam and Eve. In Genesis chapter 4, after Cain killed his brother and the Lord found out about it, he said, I will be a restless wanderer on the earth. Whoever finds me will kill me. And the Lord said, Not so. Anyone who kills Cain will suffer vengeance seven times over. Then the Lord put a mark on Cain so that no one who found him would kill him. God himself confirming that there were other people on earth and yet they're not important enough to put in the book. So again, we're dealing with an independent tradition. Genesis chapter 4 was not composed at the same time or by the same people who composed Genesis chapter 2 and 3. There are a number of indications of this, but one big difference between Genesis chapters 2 and 3 in Genesis chapter 4 is Genesis chapter 4 is telling a story about people who live on an already inhabited earth. So the idea that Adam, Eve, and their offspring are the only people on earth is not there in Genesis chapter 4. And when the two narratives are brought together and stitched together, that creates this narrative incongruity, which would have been overcome anciently by a variety of different rationalizations, and people come up with rationalizations of their own today. But for the editors who brought those stories together, uh, they either didn't notice, which I think is probably unlikely, or they just had rationalizations of their own, and that wasn't their priority.